Thank you very much. All right, I spent the last two days since I've arrived racking my brain how to squeeze a four-hour presentation into two hours. It has not been easy. So I'm going to go through this at a pace, not because I want to confuse you or myself, but I feel like if I leave anything out, I feel like I'm robbing you of valuable content. And, you know, what do you leave out of something that's a work in progress that started out you know, eight years ago with a small little presentation and now consists of volumes and volumes of, of research and discovery that is, I for one, certainly did not expect to happen to me. So let's kick off. Um, the history of our planet is far more mysterious and stranger than most of us will ever realize. And just by talking to the people here, it becomes very evident. The more people you talk to at this conference, the more evident it becomes. And the interesting thing is that the, more, the closer you get to this beautiful blue planet, the more you realize how deeply divided we are as a species. And it's that division, very constructively created division that is being used against ourselves. And this becomes very evident by the end of my presentation. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about. The great human puzzle. Who are we? Where do we come from? Why are we here? Everyone has asked those questions, the three holy trinity questions, if you can call them that. It sounds so simple. We should have all these answers at our fingertips, and yet we can't, you know, define these answers with any kind of confidence, because every time we think we've reached some sort of answer, everything shifts and changes and sends us in a completely different direction. And uh, I normally have a lot more slides here to go into much more detail, but I edited those out. <laughs> Sound and resonance seem to be the common denominators of religion and creation. No matter how far back you go, no matter how many civilizations you look at, eventually, if you scratch deep enough, that's what you're gonna find. Sound, resonance, frequency, but primordially the sound. And it also somehow connects us to opening us to understanding high levels of consciousness. And that becomes very important as we go through this presentation. In Christianity, it's the word. God said, let there be light. Okay, let's not get into the semantics. Yes, that we can define that in very various ways, but let's look at the basic stuff that we're dealing with here. The word First there was the word. In Hinduism, we got the Om, the primordial creative source. The Egyptians sang the universe into creation. All comes to sound. And it gets more interesting as you get look at some of the more bizarre and ancient cultures. And you can see this, how these days of creation and the creation, the sound of creation is manifested in some of the symbology used in sacred geometry. For example, Christianity can be very quickly described with sacred geometric principles. And you realize that the creator of the universe is not some guy with a white beard sitting on a cloud. You know, that's just complete fairy tale stuff and very distinct part of the control system of humanity. That division principle plays itself out in that philosophy. Six aspects of Om, or the Omani Padme Hum. You, sound, you see sound frequencies related to the creation process. And in, uh, in Egyptology, the six aspects of the all-seeing eye of Horus. And when you see this, you realize that we're dealing with sound. Six resonance ratios, all to do with sound frequencies. So sound plays a very important role. And one of the lesser known statements or thought patterns of Nikola Tesla that a lot of people seem to miss is that te um, Nikola Tesla said that the earth rings like a bell. It's continuously ringing like a bell. And if you know how to use this primordial so source, sound frequency of Mother Earth, you'll know how to convert it into an unlimited source of energy. And I believe that's what he really did. What he did with it up at the top of the tower remains a mystery to most of us, and we're all trying to emulate that. But I believe that he was talking about the sound of Gaia, an unlimited free source of energy. And this plays a very important part in all of creation, in all ancient cultures, in all the belief systems. And I believe Tesla used this to do whatever he did to create this free energy that we're all trying to, to emulate. But what is sound? What is sound? Because we think that sound is just something that travels at a finite um, speed. Well, that's been busted now because in Tennessee, and uh, you studied at, at, in Tennessee, didn't you? 
Brooks, uh, at the Middle State Tennessee University in 2005, there were three high school students and two undergraduates that proved that sound travels beyond the speed of light. I'm not going to go into that, but that's an interesting thing to contemplate. That's one of the best kept secrets of science and physics. Never made it into the mainstream news bulletins. Sound boils water. This is a guy called Peter Davy in New Zealand. Since 1940, this guy's been boiling water with sound, sound frequency. It's not complicated because everything has a resonance. Everything in the creation and in physical form has its own fundamental resonant frequencies. If we understand the resonance and the sound behind the resonance, we can do everything. Because if sound created the universe and all things in it, because that was done by God, then we should be able to use sound to do everything else. A 92-year-old Christchurch inventor claims to have come up with a novel way to make a cup of tea. He's invented a contraption that he claims uses the power of sound to boil water. Beverly Lockhart went to investigate. It looks like a desk lamp is cool to the touch and appears to be doing nothing until it comes into contact with water. 92-year-old former Spitfire pilot Peter Davy claims his invention uses the power of sound to boil water. Yes, I uh, they, uh, a bit baffled how it works. Nobody really knows how it works. Yeah. Davy believes high-frequency sonic vibrations emitted from within the silver bulb cause the water to boil. He says the idea came to him 50 years ago when he noticed different saxophone notes caused different household items to rattle. The mains-powered gizmo has experts intrigued. Never seen anything like it in my life, as they say. Professor Williamson has his doubts about Davy's acoustic theory and suspects there are two simple electrodes inside the boiler. It's the conductivity of the water that provides the, the path for the, for the current and provides the resistance to give the heating. I'm careful that I don't divulge everything. I'm waiting to get a manufacturer that's prepared to put some money into it. And if he does get it on the shelves, he's already got one interested customer. If I saw one in a shop, I'd buy one, because I, I, I think they're an interesting little bit of technology, however it is they work. They work. But for now, Davy is savouring his gizmo's success and sticking to his own unique theory on how it works. Beverly Lockhart, 3 News. And in there lies the problem. He's dead. He took his secret to his grave. We will never find out until we go there, try and wrestle, wrestle it out of his family to share the secret with the rest of the world. I can't believe that in all of the world of science and the brand, you know, the amazing laboratories that we have, there haven't been some scientists that have reverse engineered this or figured this out. It can't be that difficult. It's a resonant harmonic frequency of boiling water. Reverse engineer it. Measure the resonant harmonic frequency of boiling water and build the device. I don't have the laboratory to do it, but you know, I've asked so many people to go out and do it, and no one's done it. So, but what we learn from this experience is we're here at this conference talking about free energy. I believe free energy means free to the world, not just free that we can suck it out of the, the vacuum and then sell it to the rest of the world. That's no longer free energy. I believe it's crucial that we start thinking about free energy as when you find it, like this guy, give it to the world for free. Because if you don't, they're going to get to you, they're going to get rid of you, and no one's going to get it. They were waiting. I, can't, I can imagine what the they, they did when uh, Peter Davy died. They breathed a sigh of relief. Said, oh, thank God he's gone. And he was too greedy to tell the world how the simple thing worked. Thank God this human greed gene is so powerful that it prevents people from sharing this beautiful stuff. That's what I have a problem with. So what I urge anyone here at this conference to do, if you do find something like this, a source of free energy, do not keep it to yourself. Do not try and gain from the rest of humanity. Put it on the internet, make videos, put it out as widely as you can, share it for free with the world. It'll come back to you in abundance that you can't imagine. Yes. <laughs> so... <laughs> so Sound levitates. All ancient cultures talk about levitating things with sound, not just sound, but also with mind and thought. Now, we hear about it all the time, but until you see something being levitated by sound, it's difficult to comprehend. Here's a beautiful example. Most of the stuff exists on YouTube, but we don't go looking for it. So, um, 
Notice that you can hear the sound frequencies because the items they're levitating are very light. Remember, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. So these polystyrene items are very light, so the, the, the frequency is lower frequency that's audible to our ears. So when you're trying to levitate giant Those blocks, attached, you'd need very high frequencies that you can't hear. And then it looks like magic. <laughs> also note that the sound source comes from two different sound sources and it seems to levitate it at the cross point. The crossroad of the sound frequencies, that's what the levitation effect is. This is very important later in my presentation. And the knowledge of the ancient cultures. Just the slightest sound variation and the thing starts to tumble and spin. Slightest little variation on the frequency. Look where it starts to spin. So sound levitates. It's no longer, you know, this imagine this fairy tale thing. It really happens. But sound source is also the inspiration for all the religions in the world, the great religions, and the most recognized religious symbols. This is from the guys that developed the cymoscope. I normally show the cymoscope, but lack of time. So look at this 3D bubble that is created as sound. Remember, sound is a three-dimensional thing. From the pop, it goes in all directions. It's not a, a wave on a piece of paper. It's a three-dimensional effect that keeps amplifying itself and goes on and on and on. Just because you can't hear it anymore doesn't mean it's not necessarily there. So here's a three-dimensional bubble that's created at the sound. But look on the right-hand side at the cross-section of it. What do you see? You start seeing one of the most commonly recognized religious symbols. Why did the religions choose the symbols? Because when you drill right into the middle of this, what seems to be at the very source of sound, the pop, or that moment instant of pop, this is what you get. Oh boy, do I recognize this interesting symbol. And this is where you realize when the ancient cultures carved these intricate things into rock, they weren't just imagining things. They understood that sound was the source and how sound can create and levitate and manifest shape and form. And that's why they, that's why they carved hundreds of thousands of these crosses in circles. And not only did they carve it, but it's also recognized by ancient cultures in southern Africa. It's known as Mabona, the Lord of Light. Lord of light, sound and light, the creator of all things, the source of all things. And you see this shape um, re um, repeat itself in some of the most popular religious symbols like the Coptic and the pagan crosses. You see the sacred geometric patterns imitate themselves in these, uh, in these symbols. It becomes very interesting because now you know where they get the symbols from. It all comes from sound. What does this have to do with ancient civilizations and evolution of consciousness? Well, everything, because the ancient cultures understood this. They understood the process. They understood the source. And they used the source of sound as a source of energy. And this is what my discoveries show in South Africa. The resonating chambers for creation of energy, that's what the pyramids were. Many, many researchers are starting to reach that conclusion that they were actually resonating cavities to create huge amounts of energy. And they would have looked something like this. What's also clear to me, the more research I do, especially at the sites in South Africa, realizing that we're dealing with sound and light, that they probably used light to activate some of these sound devices. They were actually resonating chambers, that it was activated by light. And this is why they were aligned with solstices and equinoxes with specific frequencies and, and energetic alignments of the, the movement of the sun that would activate the, these, these ancient sites and then bring them to life. Something like that. And if you think that's not happening, there's an interesting photograph that is available on the internet of some strange energy forms coming out of the pyramids, uh, taken with some weird lens that shows you um, uh, energetic um, frequencies and uh, 
This got me very excited because this is directly connected to my discoveries in the stone circles of southern Africa. This is some interesting symmetrical interference patterns that were taken at Stonehenge, which tells us that Stonehenge was not an accidental bunch of, you know, long haired loincloth, you know, cavemen that built this with ropes and pulleys. And when you go to Stonehenge, they still have that image on the side of the, of the tunnel as you walk towards Stonehenge. They still show the guys with ropes and pulleys building Stonehenge. It's insane. So it's a very, very advanced de device, Stonehenge. And what blew my mind is how old Stonehenge is. This is probably one of the oldest sites on Earth. It's way, probably more than a million years old. Are there any geologists here? Any geologists? Well, most of you are homemade geologists, sir. Um, you, the, the, you, you're told that that stone there fell over. It was the twin of that stone, and it fell over. Right? They were connected at the top, and it broke when it fell over. Well, there's the break. Okay? Now, this is sarsen stone. It's very, very hard, one of the hardest stones known to us. There's the break. Does that look like a 5,000-year-old break in erosion? Absolutely not. We're dealing with hundreds of thousands, probably millions of years of erosion to erode about this far. This is not a new structure, people. Stonehenge is extremely old. Your mother will lie to you. Your priest will lie to you. But the geology is not going to lie to you. There it is. Do this what you want. It tells us we're dealing with ancient sites and advanced knowledge of sound frequency. Because we see it in the patterns that, they, that the Stonehenge site still generates today. Even though it is in the state of disrepair. Just like the stone circles in South Africa in the incredible state of disrepair, are still giving us insane amount of energy that we don't know what to do with. This is another example of how st old stone ages. That crack was clearly not there when the builders built it. You wouldn't put a lintel up with a crack in it. So we have to assume the crack happened after the event. And look at the erosion around the crack. I mean, this is insane amount of erosion. So modern-day levitator. Southern Florida, this guy called Ed Leeds Cullen in the 20s bought, built this amazing place called Coral Castle. This is still a mystery to a lot of people, or they don't know about it. And he single-handedly put these giant blocks on top of each other, carved them, sculpted them, shaped them on his own. The interesting thing is when, when they used to bring these, these uh, the trucks used to deliver these rocks, he would, he would uh, offload them single-handedly. And nobody knew how he did it. He always made the guy stand around the corner or something like that until one day two young schoolboys saw him offloading these giant coral blocks. And they came home very excited saying, hey, mommy, mommy, we saw the guy. And they asked, how did he do it? And the kids said, well, he did it with ice cream cones in his hands, two ice cream cones. And the parents imagined, ah, naughty children, what are you talking about? You're trying to force us into buying your ice cream for dinner, right? Well, that's not true. When I heard that, I got extremely excited because that is consistent with what I've been finding in Southern Africa ice cream cones, cone-shaped tools, and that's why I call it the ice cream cone phenomenon. <laughs> and this has become a very important part of trying to unravel the ancient mystery, how they did this stuff. They used sound, they levitated stuff, but how did they do it? And I find many of these cone-shaped tools scattered all over southern Africa, among the ruins, wherever you go. I was up the mountain two weeks ago, again, walking through areas that I've never been before. Remember, at this stage, I'm the only guy researching this, the whole of Southern Africa. It's like, I'm the only guy researching Egypt. That's the equivalent of that. Is one guy in all of Egypt let loose to do, you know, try and get some sanity out of this. And uh, so I feel a little lonely, so come help. <laughs> so... The, the, just to show you that these ice cream cone, cone shaped tools are everywhere. They, there are thousands of them. I've just collected a few because after a while you get bored. You know, say, oh, there's another one over there. And uh, then you get to, these, to the Rosicrucian Museum in the United States, and guess what I find? These cone shaped tools on display with Sumerian writing on it, uh, Sumerian cuneiform writing on it, commemorating the building of the temples in Suma. They were then stored in the walls and hidden in secret chambers in the walls that were re retrieved from the secret chambers in the walls. Now they're on display in the United States. Cone-shaped tools commemorating the building of the temples in Sumer. Ha, huh, the plot thickens, doesn't it? 
So let's go back to South Africa or Southern Africa. The current belief system is that Southern Africa was a sparsely populated part of the world with only a few inhabitants up to about a thousand years ago. And they tell you about maybe 5,000 people, maximum 10,000 people, hunter-gatherers running around, shooting a buck here, shooting a buck there. Well, they don't do their homework when they put this in our history books and they insult our intelligence because unfortunately the ancient stone ruins of southern Africa tell us a completely different tale. But they still continue to put in our history books still today that these are just cattle crawl for keeping cattle. These amazing stone structures that cover most of southern Africa, but they didn't know that it covered most of southern Africa, so they put these ignorant things into our history books and then we pay lots of money to send our children to university to regurgitate this crap. Right? And it's, it's spectacular. They just make the stuff up, put it in the history books, but because they doctor this and doctor that, everybody just kisses their butt and nobody questions them. Um, it's really sad, but just to show you what some of these structures look like, I'll go through these rapidly. Uh, they are really re remarkable structures. And the walls are not very high. Sometimes they're flat with the ground. Some places they're three meters tall or two and a half meters high. They the most important thing that you need to notice is that each one is completely unique and different. There are not two that are even closely, remotely the same. Each one is completely unique. Now that was a question that wasn't asked until I came along. What you also need to look, look at is the stuff around the obvious structures, not the structures themselves, because you'll see that there's a lot of stuff around the structures that is hidden by soil. It's not visible to you unless you're up in the air like you're looking at from this vantage point. Otherwise, you don't even know it's there. You walk through the felt, you have no idea you're walking over ruins. And then when you look at it on Google, you say, oh my goodness, I was walking there and I was walking right through all these ruins and these terraces. I didn't even know it while I was walking there. And this is the awakening that happens. Um, I mean, let me just go back here. I mean, look at this horseshoe shaped structure here attached in, with a circle inside it, with a stone right in the middle of it with this, these weird two, like, um, you know, towers that lead you in there, and this, this arm of this from the center goes right through the middle of this. There's some weird stuff going on here that we don't understand. Look at all this stuff hidden by soil underneath around this obvious ruin here. There's another horseshoe shape, ohm shaped structure. And what does ohm represent in modern electronics and electricity? It's linked to vibration, frequency, um, the movement of current, and so forth, resistance. Look at all the stuff in between, covered by soil. You have no idea that there's, that there's much more of this stuff in between, connecting this one to that one. And then they build beautiful flower-shaped stone structures because they look like pretty flowers, right? Except you can only see it from the air. And they're all connected by these channels. There's a channel coming out of it and a channel running down there that's badly destroyed and these strange hexagonal shapes. What is activity all about in Southern Africa? Always about gold. Don't you ever forget it. Always about gold. And remember, it's not the obsession of humans with gold. It's the God's obsession with gold. In Genesis 2, when Adam was alone on earth, Eve had not yet been fashioned from his rib. God comes to Adam and says, hey, buddy, there's a place called Havilah. It's land full of milk and honey. The land is good. The water is good. And by the way, buddy, there's gold. What on earth is going on here? Why would God, the creator of the universe and all things in it, the commander of consciousness, want to tell Adam about gold? And it's in that one defining moment that you divide God with a big G from God with a small G. Huge, huge division. The twain shall never meet. And the Bible and ancient texts seem to be, especially the Bible, is constantly crossing those lines. What I find fascinating, scholars that have been studying the Bible for 30 years, their entire life, still keep crossing that line. God with a big G, God with a small G. The Elohim is a plural. The Elohim and the Anunnaki are the same beings, and I'll show you why. We've got conclusive evidence that the Anunnaki and the Elohim were the gods of the Bible, the gods with a small G, the malicious, male malevolent beings that were after gold. The divine creator of all things does not want gold. He doesn't take credit cards, and he doesn't use money. <laughs> and we'll get to that. The ancient history of Southern Africa is all about gold. You can't, you know, the whole Monomotapa kingdom that was attacked by everybody from the north, and they could never be overthrown, the, the golden kings of Monomotapa. Fascinating story. Not many people are even aware of it. What do other ancient cultures or other ancient texts tell us? Well, the Sumerian tablets tell us in great detail about the Anunnaki. And 
all the great biblical stories are first found in the Sumerian tablets in much greater detail. And when they, like the, you know, the, fa the creation of Eve from Adam's rib, is reduced to two lines in the Bible. In the Sumerian tablets, there's a whole chapter on it, how it happened, how they put Adam into a deep sleep, and blah, blah, blah. It's like, it's phenomenal information. But, uh, so, what we, what we do know is that a lot of the stories in the Sumerian tablets are translated into the Bible much later and abused or used for abuse against humanity. Work in the Abzu is the constant reference in the Sumerian tablets. Abzu has been given many names, but its primary, obje primary sort of reference is always linked with gold. This is, Abzu is where the gold came from, and there's some great references from Sitchin's work um, when where the landmass, the shape of a heart was given, in the lower parts thereof, golden veins from the earth's innards were abundant. Abzu, of gold the birthplace, ear to the region the name gave. And you, you know, I'll draw that comparison for you to show what he's talking about. The Sumerian god Enki is inextricably linked to southern Africa and the gold mining empire. And the, in my longer presentations, I go into more detail why I say this, but it's just overwhelming. It keeps coming in waves and waves how Enki is linked to, this, to Southern Africa and the gold mining empire that he set up there some 400,000 years ago. Now, Enki is not unknown in African history, ancient history. Uh, creator Mutwa told me that Enkai, Enki is known as Enkai, the creator of the human race just to throw that at you. And it gets, it gets weirder and weirder the deeper you go into this. Um, and then Enki decides to create a species because they needed help to get the gold out of the mine. You can't just use machines. You, machines break. And they, you know, it's much easier to, to clone a species and train them and let them do this stuff because if they die or get sick, then you just replace them. It's better than building machines. They just breed on their own. Look what, look what they've done. Seven billion. Great breeders, these machines, these, these slaves. Let us create a Lulu, a primitive worker. The hardship work to take over. Let the being, the toil of the Anunnaki, carry on his back. Tells us very clearly what these guys were up to down there. Planning to create the Adam, Adamu. A primitive worker shall be created. Our command will he understand. Our tools he will handle. To the Anunnaki in the Abzu, relief shall come. So we know that the Anunnaki were in the Abzu. They were doing something. They needed relief. And for this, they needed a slave. And they cloned it. And boy, did they do a good job. <clears throat> this is fantastic reference to Enki's house, his mines, and his technology. In the midst of the Abzu, to a place of pure waters, Enki betook himself. In that land, a place of deepness, he determined for the heroes into the earth's bowels to descend. Before they cloned the slaves or the, 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 the human race, they referred to the Anunnaki who were doing the gold mining as the heroes because they were doing the hard work in the gold mines. So that, for the heroes into earth's bowels to descend. The earth splitter that Enki established, now I'm going to show you the earth splitter because this is one of my discoveries in South Africa. Um, therewith in the earth a gash to make. By way of tunnels, earth's innards to reach, the golden veins to uncover. Boy, now that we found the physical evidence in South Africa and Zimbabwe, mostly, suddenly Sitchin's work becomes like poetry because we can point to what he's referring to. We've got the physical evidence for which he's often undergone a lot of criticism, you know. Oh, he's making this stuff up. Well, you know, anyone who's still a naysayer about Sitchin's work, wake up. We got the physical evidence. It's there in beyond believable abundance. Is there a ruin or a settlement that could be linked to Enki? Absolutely. And this is Great Zimbabwe, the greatest ruin in southern Africa. It has to be the biggest, right? This is uh, just a spectacular place. And uh, just to show you, I mean, some of the walls are 10 meters high and 6 meters wide. Great Zimbabwe is a spectacular site. And it has got Enki's energetic imprint all over it. Any of you that do energetic work, go and look at it. You're not going to believe your eyes. What's so special about the ruins in southern Africa? Well, they're very special cattle kraal for very special cattle, because this is probably where the word holy cow comes from. <laughs> uh, they, because most of these cattle kraal are built aligned to the sun and the stars and the equinoxes and the solstices. And, and wow, they went to a lot of trouble for these cattle, didn't they? And the sacred geometry, and you start seeing how sacred geometric principles just jump out of it, uh, out of these structures, and you realize, hold on, this is not just somebody building, uh, building things, you know, to pass time. They were, 
and clearly that was, this was easy to these people because every single one of these ruins that is measured, and this is all Jan Heine's original pioneering work for which you'll always be remembered, because every ruin that he's measured so far turns out to have these very intricate alignments. And this is spectacular. And you'll understand why this is so spectacular when you realize how many of these ruins there are. These, you know, look at this. They're perfect, and you draw a circle over there, which doesn't look, it doesn't look like it, it, it's real. But when you extrapolate that flat line into the circle, you get a perfect, perfect hexagon. When you start joining the corners of the hexagon, look how it touches the inner circle perfectly. You know, this is not accidental, people. This takes real um, exact science and understanding. There you go. So these structures down there are not just simplistic structures. They carry huge amounts of energy. And uh, important to note that there are no doors or entrances. This is an important thing that you find in some of the archaeological reports. But, and they say, oh, there are no doors and entrances. And then they forget about it. And then they tell you, it was probably built by a migrating crew, group of 15 to 20 people. And they built it. And you say, hold on, you just told me there are no doors and entrances. And now you're telling me that it was built by people as, as a dwelling. So what's going on here? What, what, what are we dealing with here? And, and you, you don't get intelligent answers from the so-called authorities on this. Um, and agricultural terraces, thousands of kilometers of agricultural terraces. In fact, more than 450,000 square kilometers of agricultural terraces in a sparsely populated part of the world. Who built these terraces? What were they planting in these terraces? What's going on here? It doesn't fit. It doesn't match. Terraces are everywhere. When you start looking and opening your eyes, Mountains are covered by these terraces. This is in Botswana. This is in Lesotho. There are terraces up some of the most incredible steep mountain uh, sides that don't make any sense. In fact, if you go into Google Earth and you look at Lesotho, I challenge you to find any part of Lesotho without terraces. It's actually quite incredible. There are just terraces everywhere. And there's just been no people down there to build these terraces. So where do they come from? This is one of the greatest examples because you can see the, the channels that link them, the circles and the terraces, all one giant grid. Nothing stands alone. Remember I told you, look at around the circles, the stuff hidden by the soil, because there are no standalone circles. They're all part of a giant grid, a huge grid. No standalone, all connected by these weird channels that are clever people at university call roads to drive the cattle on. <laughs> this is why these roads are there because they were built because the people 200 years ago built them to drive their cattle on. And that's as far back as they go. Maybe 400 years ago, that's it. This is just spectacular. This is right up the road from where I live. So when I leave my house and I go walking in the mountains, this is what I walk in, in these places. And I, you know, it's rather silly. So I take a lot of photographs and, and I write a whole bunch of stuff and then I come talk to people like you and, and I feel like I'm, you know, alone, lost in the world. <laughs> um, Ancient, ancient, ancient roads and channels run for hundreds of miles. Notice, circle, channel, and the extrapolation or the extension of the circle that looks like a giant spider's web. And it's these giant spider's web that turn into these agricultural terraces. And there's a very specific reason why this is all connected, which you'll understand soon. Look at these archaeological drawings from 1939, clearly showing us that there are no doors and entrances, and then these circles are all connected like a bunch of grapes. And then they don't make any more comments about it. They just leave it. The roads link every stone circle. There's a road there. It's very, very badly eroded, as you can see. Most of the times, you don't even know you're walking on these, on these uh, ruins. Over there at the bottom, it used to connect in there, but that looks like water washed it away at some stage. Look at this linking into these strange hexagonal things. There's not enough time to talk about that, but there's spectacular information about what is going on there. Uh, and there's ruins there and there, but they're just covered by soil. This is a beautiful example of a channel running into a so with all the stuff around it, the spider's web effect. Look at this. Now, I imagine most of Southern Africa looking like this a long, long time ago. And um, these are all cattle crawlers, I said, built for special cattle. There were a lot of cattle. Boy, they were just, uh, I don't know where the people were, but there were a lot of cattle. <laughs> hey, maybe. Uh, how many of these ruins 
are there? And this is where the penny really drops when you start figuring out how many there were. In 1891, the brilliant Theodore Bent, this is one of the only, one of the few archaeologists that I carry real respect for, um, wrote a brilliant book, The Vanished uh, Lost Cities of Mashona Land, and it's a phenomenal um, book. And in 1891, from horseback, traveling through South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, he estimated about 4,000 of these structures. Then by 1974, Roger Summers, who had more technology available, calculated about 20,000 of these stone ruins. Now, by now, I started going, hold on, 20,000 stone ruins in a sparsely populated continent doesn't make any sense. I got involved in 2007 when Jan Heiner introduced me to this, and within six months, I estimated at least 100,000 ruins. So I thought, well, before I release temples of the African gods, I can't just thumb suck the stuff. Let me have some sort of at least scientific argument for this. So I started counting. I used Google and aerial shots and... and uh, just started counting, you know, and extrapolating, getting averages per hectare, per square kilometer, per larger area, and I went all over Southern Africa and found these densely clustered areas and got averages, and, um, and some of the aerial photographs looks like, you know, there's circles here. When you look closer at it, when you study this, you see how connected they were. Um, this is all over Southern Africa. Some of them are in... in in the Transvaal or in Gauteng, what used to be the Transvaal, in, in Pumalanga, in the Orange Free State. If there's some in, in Natal, KZN. I just found some in KZN two weeks ago when I traveled to KZN. And I hadn't found any before. So wherever you go, you find more, more ruins. Zimbabwe, Botswana, as I mentioned. Um, and this one I'll be talking about again. Um, this is near a town called Bronco Sprite, very strange looking structures. This is again close to my house, and uh, this is south of Johannesburg. There are thousands and thousands of these south of Johannesburg, and they think they discovered gold there in the late 1800s. <laughs> and this is just spectacular. It's the density of these, this is the other side of Rustenburg where I grew up near the platinum mines uh, on the way to Botswana. This is just, this runs about five by five kilometers, and it's just dense like this. It's ridiculous. And this is back uh, near where I live, just to show you the circles with the channels connecting them and the terraces. And by the time I finished counting, getting all these averages, I found out there were more than 10 million of these. So forget 4,000 and 20,000 and 100,000, more than 10 million of these. In fact, I cannot tell you categorically, it's probably closer to 20 million of these. And, uh, and we'll be surprised if there aren't more. It's spectacular. We're dealing with the largest and most mysterious ancient civilization on earth that no one's paid any attention to until now. What happened to them? What happened to 10 million stone structures and the people? Forget the stone structures. We've got evidence of those. Where are the bones? Where are the dead people? There's nothing. Not a trace of who occupied these. Isn't that more mysterious in itself? That for an extended period of, I'll show you, about 280,000 years, people lived and worked here then no fossil remains of these people. What on earth went on here? This is where you start listening to people like Dranvela Melchizedek, when he says that, you know, human populations have been evacuated and moved from one planet to another. You go, well, hold on, you know, suddenly that makes a little bit more sense than anything else, because we should have found bones. You know, there's been a lot of digging, mining, and there should be bones everywhere. Farmers, building houses. So what happened to them? This is where the Sumerian tablets become very important. And the king's list, I'm going to come back to this, because in, this, in the, the two king's lists that give us exactly the same story, they give us the names of eight kings that ruled for about 200, between 220 and 241,000 years. The names of the kings are the same. The places they ruled are exactly the same. The dates vary a little bit. So you've got to allow some you know, mistakes in translation. But the names and places remain the same. This is very, very interesting. But what this Sumerian, what this tells us is two very important things that I'm going to come back to later. And this is a repetitive theme in the Sumerian text. is after the kingship descended from heaven to earth, after kingship was lowered to earth from heaven. Okay. To us, it doesn't make any sense. Oh, we think it's some crap made up by the ancient people because they were all stupid, right? And, uh, and then it tells us who these kings were and how long they lived. And you can clearly see that they weren't human because they, li they lived and ruled for 36,000 years, 64,000 years, 28,000 years. And then a very important thing that it tells us, a very important statement from these two kings lists. And then the flood swept over. 
So two very important things, three, three important things. That kingship was lowered to earth from heaven. Somebody up there decided that they were going to appoint some kings on earth, some priest kings. That change all changes all of human history. It tells us that they ruled for an extended period of time, and then the flood came. So we seem to have a history, a chronology of human history, until the flood. Prior to this, or until now, we know very little about what happened before the flood. And this is very important. So I believe that when they say the flood came, that's what destroyed these ruins. Some 12 to 13,000 years ago, the so-called Great Flood that there's not much argument about in geologic and archaeological circles. And you can see the sedimentation. That's why most of these ruins are not visible. Most of them are covered by soil. They're hidden from us. And wherever there are stone circles, there are gold mines. You can't get away from it. More than 75,000 gold mines have been found between 2005 and 2010 in a geological survey just around the little town of Leidenburg in the Mpumalanga province. 75,000 gold mines. In the 30s, I've got two distinct uh, separate reports from two separate miners that mined in the province of Limpopo, northern South Africa, that found mysterious mine shafts, tunnels like this, at about 100 feet down while they were mine, mining gold. Remain unexplained. Tools and artifacts were confiscated by the authorities, never to be returned. In the 1990s, De Beers found a mine shaft 22,000 feet deep that scared them. That they, they say it was cut with absolute precision, indicating some advanced laser technology that they do not possess. Anglo-American, I know, has a secret file that they keep for covering up ancient mines and shafts. Anytime they come, up across, come across an ancient shaft or a mine, they cover it up and move on. They don't even discuss it, but they have a specific file for that. And I was told this by the chief geologist, the Anglo-American, while we were having a beer at a pub. <laughs> he just volunteered this information to me. I was amazed. But then he didn't know who I was or what I was doing. <laughs> Sneaky bastard. <laughs> what kind of stone are we dealing with here? It's a very special kind of stone. It's known as Hornfels. And it's known by geologists as ringstone. And I was the first person, I mean, I'm astounded, the first person to ask what kind of stone was used to build these ruins. They just, you know, don't go there. And uh, it's metamorphosized quartzite. It's incredibly hard. You can't break it, people. Yeah, I've tried to break some of these. This, is, this sliver is a break I keep in my museum. It, this happens as a result of heat. You expose it to fire, it breaks up. So clearly they didn't use fire in any of these ruins. Otherwise, they'd be none left. As you can see, it's black on the inside, very hard, and then it's got this stuff called patina, the skin, like a skin that grows. It's an oxidization and, and calcification process that grows incredibly slowly on this specific rock. And what is fascinating about this Hornfell stone is that it conducts sound incredibly well and rings like bell and light. There's some more examples that I found that I keep in the museum and uh, more spectacular examples. And just to show you, what? there's a little. The most remarkable artifacts that I've collected, um, this particular stone in my hand here, this beautiful Stone Age club, it looks like something out of Flintstones. Uh, and to, I'm gonna show you how they ring like bells um, because I can't carry these with me all over the world. So a quick, demonstration how these stones ring like bells. I just discovered that in geological terms these stones, this particular stone, the Hornfels in South Africa, is also known as ring stone for that very specific reason. And to ring these I'm going to use my brand new tool that I just collected about a, month, a week ago. This phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal artifact. Um, and I'm going to use this to ring these stones. This looks, we always joked when I found this, that this looks like a, a Stone Age guitar. And it's pretty much like that, you know. And uh, I'm going to show you that it is very closely related to a musical instrument in ancient times for very specific reasons. Now you might think that the stone shape is just accidental and that it broke off or something. You'd be mistaken because I've collected probably about four or five stones that are very, very similar in shape. Very similar um, carving structure, this broad base here, and then down to a narrow tip. And somebody removed this particular piece of the stone over there for specific reasons, as you will hear, which I'll ring a little bit more. Uh, they ring like bells. But um, it's also important to note that you cannot carve or chip this stone. 
it will splinter and fragment and it will not be chipped or carved. Okay, so these, these shapes that we see here must have been molded in some way and molded for specific acoustic properties. And this is why. You've got to hold it a very specific way to make as little contact as possible to get it to ring and resonate at its optimum. Now remember it's also covered in patina, the skin of the rock, this brown reddish color that covers the rock that is no longer the original black or charcoal color, the original color of the, um, the metamorphosized quartzite that's underneath. And that's how it rings. I can actually feel my fingers underneath are deadening the ringing because I'm holding it and it's deadening some of the effect. There we go. That's better. That's what you want. You realize that this thing really rings like a bell and it reverberates for quite a long time. Alright, and now to show you that this is not the only one, here's the other one. The Stone Age Club. And I drove over this myself a few times, driving up the mountain uh, of the forest road, and eventually I stopped and picked it up because I realized this is one of the most remarkable tools that you will ever find, and thank God I did. And it is very heavy. I'm out of breath because I'm holding my breath not to make a noise. And this thing weighs probably about 15 kilos. So. And there you go. Demonstration how these stones ring like bells. And they were used in all kinds of ways and fashions just like the Ankh to create specific vibrational frequencies and specific notes to use as a form and a source of energy. And just to remind you, metamorphosized quartzite is full of what? So, we can talk about this later when we start getting into the consciousness principles. What are we really dealing with here? And what do these ancient sites contain? How much information is actually stored in these ancient sites? Yes. Just a quick question with the stones there. I noticed that the frequency was the same. It seemed to be the same note. Did you actually ever try and measure the exact frequency? Yes, we did. Uh, we measured. It were not not those two. I haven't tested those two. But uh, I was somebody emailed me. I get thousands of emails. Somebody emailed me saying that's a B flat. I think. Uh, and uh, that is very important. But it's just not enough time to go through all the stuff. Sorry. <laughs> And then uh, the, all these anomalous tools I've been collecting and finding, strange tools. Once again, some of them are these cone-shaped tools, always to these points. And then the stone phallus, stone phalluses seem to be um, very popular in these ancient times. Um, What's well, important to note, see how the patina has covered all of them, remember? Somebody must have carved them or shaped them at some stage. And they're all covered in this brown patina. Okay, keep that at the back of your mind. Uh, this is at the top of the big ruin on top of the mountain there, that's spectacular, whatever that is, uh, a bird-shaped stone, or a, there's a whole other link to the Zimbabwe birds that is in here, but uh, we can't go there. Um, these strange tools and artifacts that are just spectacular, that make no sense to us today, because it's not part of normal archaeological you know, um, stuff that they exhibit. And then the most spectacular mystery in, in all of archaeology, the sacred stones, the special sacred stones. Hundreds of thousands have been found in Southern Africa. Now, because we had a, a breakthrough energy conference, you'll automatically notice that they resemble a, a torus shape. So I'm giving you a little hint as to what these are for. But in South Africa, the Archaeological Society has it as a logo, and they will still teach you that these are weights for digging sticks, that the people made them, in the hundreds of thousands, when there were only a few thousand hunter-gatherers, because this is from the Stone Age, right? So there were no metal tools. They made this with other stones because they needed weights for their digging sticks when they were digging for roots in the felt. 
I can't think of anything more insane. These people should be locked up. <laughs> Where's the flagship among all these ruins? And this is where we get to the very important Adam's calendar. It was rediscovered in 2003 by Johann Heiner, and he'll always be remembered for that because this is one of the most spectacular discoveries in all of human archaeological history. Those are the two central calendar stones. Baba Kreda Mutwa, the preeminent African shaman, told me when I saw him, there you can see Adam's calendar in my other book lying on the desk. When I showed him this book, he burst into tears and took quite a while to, to calm himself down. He said he never thought he'd see that sacred place again. He was initiated at this place in 1937 as a young shaman, and he calls it Inzalo Yelanga, or birthplace of the sun. Specifically, the S-O-N, not S-U-N, because it is believed by the shaman that this is where the gods created humanity, <coughs> birthplace of the sun. That's what it looks like from a helicopter, circular structure, that is north, that is south, not the trees, the stones under the trees. Um, there are the two central calendar stones, and over there you see a wooden pole, that's where the stone man used to stand, and right from the stone man across there, across the Horus bird lying there, which you'll see we looking east, exactly east at the rise of the sun, on the edge of this cliff, which is known as the Transvaal Escarpment. There's looking north, exactly north, between the two stones. You can see north-south line goes right between the two central calendar stones. And uh, why is it a calendar? This is Jan Heiner showing me for the, for, of our very first visit there. Why it's a calendar, and he did all the original calculations when he rediscovered it. This setting sun casts a shadow. This rock casts a shadow on this one. And you can tell every day of the year from the summer solstice on this side until the winter solstice on that side, and it comes back. So it's still an accurate calendar, and one of the few that I know, uh, I, I can't think of any others that do this, uh, monolithic calendars or, or Stone Age calendars. This is a 3D reconstruction that we did, um, putting the stone man back in his place, who was removed in 1994 by the Minister of uh, Environmental Affairs, <laughs> <laughs> to put a plaque on it to commemorate the opening of the Blue Swallow Nature Reserve. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> desecrating one of the oldest sites on earth. <laughs> and then they try and prevent us going there because we're bringing tourists there and we're we desecrating the place. <laughs> and there you have, uh, looking out east from the stone man across the, the calendar stones, very distinct Horus stone, looking at what? Three stones that seem to align with those pyramidal structures over there that are aligned with the rise of Orion over there. But you'll see more um, about that now. How do we date the stones? We look at everything. I'll look at anything because you can't date stones. So you've got to look at everything. Use your, you know, do what the guys in CSI do. Follow the clues and the evidence. And what makes most sense, you have to go with that. So first of all, this is, every stone there is known as dolerite. It doesn't belong there. It is now categorically proven and shown from geological studies that those stones do not belong there. They were brought there by somebody to build the calendar site. That's the edge of the Transvaal Escarpment. It's known as Black Reef Quartzite, and it's full of? gold. <laughs> There's a gold mine underneath that ridge, actually, an ancient gold mine. The erosion, that piece there broke off there. Uh, that's the erosion on the tip of that ridge, uh, on the break. Um, most geologists I've asked suggested to me, uh, pick a number above 50,000 years for the amount of erosion that happened there. So 50,000 years ago, that piece broke off and landed there. Right, so now we're starting to get to the ancient age of this. But this is one of my best, is the patina growth. Because I've told you already that these, these tools have been molded and shaped. And the patina has grown back. That's what it looks like when the patina is gone, black, and then the patina grows back. This is a great example of a monolith in one of the stone walls that at some point broke and this tip broke off. Look at the patina that's grown back. At the, there's about two millimeters of patina growth. We're dealing with something. This patina is known to grow at about 1,000 one, 1, years per microscopic layer. 1,000 years per microscopic layer. So for a millimeter or two millimeters of patina, we're dealing with something that's 100, 200, 300,000 years old. We don't really have a measure for it, but it's extremely old. And uh, we know that this is not normal archaeology. Look at this beautiful carving of one of the stone structures. So not only did they build the stone circles, but they first carved them into rock. This is another interesting part of this presentation that I normally go into a lot more detail. But look at after they carved this, this crack appeared through the rock. This hornfels, hornfels stone, you should see the black of the hornfels 
on the crack. On a fresh crack, you'll see the black of the horn fowls. But it's so old that the patina has grown into the crack and completely covered up the black color. So this shows us how old this carving is. So we're dealing with probably 50 to 100,000 years old that this carving is. So these are the kind of indicators that we have to use when you deal with this, with this kind of evidence. Because you can't follow the normal archaeological routes. They just don't have the tools to do that. But this, my friends, is by far the most important discovery, I believe. If you look at the circular, you can see the whole Adam's calendar is a circular structure, north-south. But the first thing that you notice is that it's not at 12 o'clock. It's not true north. It's slightly left of center. So Johan Heine and I had it measured, and we found out that there's a 3, three degrees, 17 minutes, and 42 second deviation anti-clockwise. Now, that's not possible, because we're not dealing with magnetic north. We're dealing with true north. And at first, we thought that this had something to do with the processional wobble. So I spent a lot of months trying to analyze and speak to experts in processional counting and all that. And I realized, hold on, I'm barking up the wrong tree. This is true north. Wherever you are in the processional wobble, true north stays at true north, right? So what's going on here? This is three and a quarter degrees deviation. I believe that the man that holds all the information is Charles Habgood, who's been trying to t teach us about crustal displacement and crustal shift. I believe that Adam's calendar is a real geophysical example that crustal shift displacement did happen because these guys did not make mistakes. They would not have accidentally built a three and a quarter degrees out of alignment. It's not going to happen. So we know that crustal displacement happened. We just don't know when. But here we have physical, geophysical evidence that it did occur. And then obviously the Orion connection. You can't get away from the Orion connection. All ancient cultures do it. I've mentioned it already. Those three. There's your Horus stone. And very, look at that distinctly carved rock there. Those three, if you lift them up, they align precisely with the rise of Orion's belt when it was flat on the horizon. I've had two separate calculations done by two separate um, astronomers. Both of those will be wrong because not, none of them took into account that three and a quarter degree um, misalignment. So, but it just shows you that they, their calculations are really, really old. That's really interesting. I didn't cross-examine on them. And uh, just to show you these, this beautiful horror stone, I discovered that one morning when I went there uh, with another guy very, very early when I started doing this exploration. And that stone was covered by soil. So we couldn't see. I didn't know that it was actually a Horus or a bird-shaped stone. But then we, when I moved the, the soil away from about there, suddenly this beautiful head and nose appeared. It doesn't look like much from here, but there's nothing to stand on to take photographs. You know, if I step, take one step backwards that way, I, I fall off the edge of the cliff. So. <laughs> um, and there you go. It's about three and a half meters tall. There's a fat belly there that you can't see on this angle. And the nose is broken off. That's probably maybe another foot there that would have extended. If you lift it up, there you go, it reconstructed Adam's calendar. When I called it Adam's calendar, I had no idea how close to the truth it was. This is where humanity was created according to ancient African culture, where the Anunnaki artificially, genetically created the Adamu, the human species that we all belong to in various forms and shapes. And then we get to the discovering of the pyramids. The mystery just, you know, gets better and better. Look at that. This is one of the first pictures taken of Johan in 2003 when he started measuring the calendar and finding out all these mysteries. One of the best pictures because I've been there thousands of times and you just don't get good pictures of the pyramidal structures. There's a third one, a little one over there just sticking its head out. I've been told through various means that there's about 30 meters of sedimentation down there. So we're only probably seeing half of those pyramidal structures um, because of the flood, remember? <coughs> the flood that destroyed all the stuff. That would have covered all of it. Why are they pyramids? Do I, why am I so convinced they're pyramids? For various reasons. First of all, when you go into Adam's calendar, the moment you cross the circle, because there's no obvious circle, it's an imaginary circle. The moment you cross that circle with your GPS, you lose signal. Okay, it works, it works here. The moment you walk in there, your signal is gone. And I love the macho guys. They just love it. Oh, my GPS will work. You'll see. I'll show you how my GPS works. <laughs> <laughs> and they go in there. <laughs> It's, it's fantastic watching them. Just see that ego drop very quickly. <laughs> and then when you take the same GPS down to the pyramids, I stood, there were four of us. I will forever regret not taking a photograph of it because there were four of us standing with GPSs like this. And every GPS gave you a completely different reading. Not just slightly off, but miles off. 
You were like, you know, in, an, in another province. It was insane, right between the two pyramids. Not only that, but all these ancient cultures built things according to the sacred geometric principles. So I thought, hold on, this will tell me if it's linked or not. Let me draw a golden mean spiral from Adam's calendar and see where it lands. <coughs> well, you know, I didn't have to guess. You got it. So here we can do a beautiful twist on those that want to stick to mainstream science. And we can argue the argument of probability, which is one of the most commonly argued arguments in science, isn't it? Probability. So the probability factor that the golden mean spiral accidentally ends between the pyramids is so completely out of kill that it has to be linked. You're dealing with several million or several billion uh, odds to one that it's you know, an accident. So the probability factor plays a very important role here. We're dealing with something that's connected. And uh, also through channelings and other psychic revelations, I've been told in no uncertain terms that we're dealing with some very advanced stuff here. And then when you connect Adam's pyramids through Great Zimbabwe, Enki's house, it lands right in the Great Pyramid of Giza. And um, all along the 31 degrees east longitudinal line, the Nilotic Meridian, right, which is also linked to the white lions of Timbavati, the sacred white lions of Africa. And you start seeing all this connection. It, it's just beautiful. It just unravels more and more. And then my beautiful friend Willem de Swart, who's decoded the numeric system and the secret numbers of God, made it very clear to me that the name Elohim is, equates to the number 31, El Elohim. 31 degrees east longitudinal line. So this gives us an indication that the Anunnaki and the Elohim are the same group of beings. I just recently did an interview with George Nuri. The very last caller that called in told me he was abducted by the Anunnaki 12 years ago before he knew any of the stuff we're talking about here. They told him they were tall, about nine feet tall, blonde, blue-eyed individuals. They told him they were the Anunnaki, and they also told him they were often referred to as El or Elohim. That was very interesting. And then the show ended, so I need to talk to him more. So what were all these stone circles for? S millions and millions of stone structures, all connected. Each one is completely unique, different, built with stones that ring like bells. What's going on here? Archaeological drawings show us that there are no doors and entrances, and some of them are concentric circles, like expansion, amplification chambers, or something to that extent, right? So are these connectors, these channels, actually like wires? Absolutely. So let's go back to what Nikola Tesla said. He said the earth rings like a bell and it's an inexhaustible source of energy if you know how to use the sound frequency of Gaia. And I believe that this is what it is. The cymatic patterns remind us of what we're looking at. The shape of Om. This is the shape of Ah, sand on a metal plate. That's what you'll find. So what we're looking at here is cymatic patterns from earth. Each one of these stone circles just simply represents the cymatic Freak or the shape of the sound of Gaia at that particular point. And this is why they connected. So they created one huge energetic field. There's one example. There's a Hans Jenny's photograph, the circle in the middle and the, the spider's web effect outwards, the circle in the middle, spider's web effect outwards, except these were connected so they could share the energy they suck out of Mother Earth. And, uh, but how much energy could these structures create? For this, we got to go to 1944 in Japan when they were de developing the death ray with which they were going to smite the Allied army. But unfortunately, they got nuked, so they never got to use the death ray. But one of the things that I found out is that at the, at the core of this death ray was a, a thing that they used called a magnetron, a, a resonant cavity magnetron. Well, this is, uh, you know, you start a frequency in the middle, you amplify it in these resonant cavities until you decide when you want to take it out of the wires. And that magnetron is used in laser beams, it's used in microwaves, it's, 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 a, it's a technological tool used in many applications. This has got a little magnetron in it, or a klystron, I think it's called in this. And, uh, and then it goes through what? It goes through a crystal to focus the light. Right? So if you're working with light, you need to use crystal because it lets the light go through it. Right? So... I believe that this magnetron was used, there you go. If a magnetron a few centimeters in diameter could blast, fry the allied, allied army, how much energy can a magnetron 22 meters in diameter create? Huge amounts of energy. In fact, I was 
made aware that it's this structure that was probably responsible for the destruction of Atlantis because they didn't quite know how to use it and it got out of control. Um, so I believe when you read those translations of Sitchin, where he says Enki built the earth splitter with which in the earth a gash to make, I believe this is the earth splitter or something like that, creating huge amounts of energy, putting it into the giant grid, giant energy grid that connected all these stone structures in southern Africa. And that's really what it was. Everything was linked to the mining of gold. None of these were dwellings, people. We're dealing with a giant energy and work grid for the extraction and the mining and the processing of gold. And then get to the measuring of, the, of these stone structures. And uh, I found a guy who had a very interesting device that he, he measured without me. And then I came back from America and I heard that he went and measured these. I called him back. I said, I want to go back and do it with you. So I went with him and he used to work in the satellite industry. Uh, for Centec, uh, interesting guy, um, and he's, the measurements that he showed me were just mind-blowing. Electromagnetic waves, either horizontal or vertical, coming out of the ground into the sky, sound frequencies in, in, in hertz, the loudness in decibels, and also what he calls the heat signature. The heat signature that he explained to me, he measures up to, it's the average temperature of the ground below the soil below the surface down to about 300 meters. He's got all, all kinds of ways that he calculates this. I can't explain to you exactly how he does this, but I asked him several questions to cross-examine him to see if he was not you know, making it up, and it stayed constant. So I believe that he does have a system to work this out. This is what he measured. The outside, um, the, the heat signature anywhere outside here is five and a half degrees Celsius at the surface of the, the ground. The moment you move the device in there, it shoots up to 29 degrees. So it's five and a half degrees, 29 degrees. Five and a half degrees, 20. There's no scientific explanation for that that we, that we have right now. You go in there, it goes up to 33 degrees. Five and a half degrees, 33 degrees in the middle. What's interesting, the electromagnetic field here runs at the equivalent of about 280 megahertz, but it's, it's vertical, straight out of the ground into the sky. So it's a column of energy out of the ground into the sky. Over there, it creates like a dome-shaped effect over the circle, because you also lose GPS when you go in there. So I can now understand why you lose GPS, because it creates the circle. There's no electromagnetic activity outside. The moment you go inside there, you pick up this horizontal electromagnetic effect, equivalent to about 480 megahertz. Um, and he went into more explanation to me exactly how, how, sorry, let's go back here. And then the sound frequency, the sound frequency you measured coming out of these walls at 14 and a half gigahertz. Now we don't measure sound frequencies at those, at those. this is really mysterious. So, um, and at 72 decibels coming out of these walls. And then we went up to this one here and it got even worse. Um, measured 33 gigahertz sound frequencies coming out of this, these walls inside here, 33 gigahertz. When you walk, along this, this channel that ran in here, the wall was broken there, but the channel runs in there. It started like five degrees, it keeps going up. As you walk there, that heat signature keeps rising. By the way, the heat signature, he explained to me, can only go up to about 80 degrees Celsius, at which point it suggests that you've got a volcano under you, about 300 meters below you. So that's how he's calculated it. And uh, so at 80 degrees is the max, you know, and nothing more is possible. So we go from five and a half, and by the time you get here, it's at 33 degrees. Um, 30, about 30, about, yeah, around 30 degrees there. When you go from outside there, five and a half degrees, onto that little attachment there, inside, shoots up to 58 degrees. Five and a half degrees, 58 degrees. There's just no reason why it should be doing that. And then the, the electromagnetic waves, once again, there's a dome-shaped horizontal effect that happens inside here at, at that uh, frequency. And it's horizontal. Also, this is why when we did... Ground penetrating radar, I used the world's leading company to do ground penetrating radar on three structures. This is one of them. There was another one, uh, one of those flower shaped ones, and then at Adam's calendar. And all the way through the ground penetrating radar exercise, we, um, I kept asking the guy, are you getting GPS signal? And he says, yeah, sure. And he had a really big GPS thing on his back, and I thought, okay, well, this is our measurements are down the drain. That's it, the guy was lying to me. And then I waited after working like a dog for a whole long weekend, because to do this GPR is not easy. The GPR devices are not meant for rocky terrain. You know, you've got to drag this big box up the rocks and down the rocks. And I had to do the dragging. 
So I worked my butt off for the whole weekend expecting some results. So, you know, a week goes by and I phone the guys in Joburg and I say, have you got any results for me? I'm dying to see the results. And they say, yeah, I know, we, we've got some problems with, uh, I'll, I'll get back to you. A month goes by, nothing. Three months go, eventually I said, just tell me what's going on. He says, look, we've got real problems with the GPS. Uh, every, everything is just completely scrambled. I don't know what happened. I'm really, really sorry. But there's, it's just like complete garbage. This has never happened to us before. So I went, don't worry, it's okay. <laughs> you made me the happiest guy in the world. <laughs> because now I know that our measurements are accurate. It looks like you're getting a reading, but you're getting garbage. So when they put it in the computer, the computer nearly blew up. It said, sorry, buddy, I don't like what you're feeding me. <laughs> and then we get to Adam's calendar, and everything we know, or we think we know, just flies out the window. There's the imaginary circle once again. And as you approach it, the heat signature is at 9.5 degrees. It's a little higher than the other places. As you cross that imaginary circle, remember, there's no wall. So 9.5 degrees, as you cross in there, it shoots up to 77 degrees. 9.5, 77 degrees. But then when you go in between the two calendar stones, it shoots up to beyond 80 degrees, beyond what suggests you're standing on a volcano. This is bizarre stuff. Is, is this the human that enters there that, that makes the change? Or is, if you leave a thermometer in there, is it the temperature? It's not a thermometer. No, this is special calculation. It's a heat signature. It's not the temperature of the ground. Okay, so it's, again, it's the average temperature that he explained to me about 300 meters below the surface. Going up in temperature, suggesting that at about 80 degrees, that heat signature would equate to a volcano, volcanic activity. And then we measured the, the, uh, the, electromag the sound frequency, first of all, once again. Nothing outside. And then as you cross that imaginary circle inside, it shoots up to beyond 375 gigahertz. This is sound frequency. Now, I've never heard of anything before measuring sound frequency at these frequencies. In fact, I've had several people argue with me that sound doesn't exist at those frequencies. I say, oh, well, it just disappears. What happens to sound? It just disappears because we can't hear it. So there's an interesting debate to be had there with some of the brainy people out there. 375 degrees, uh, gigahertz sound frequency. That's insane. That's, that's ridiculous. But then the electromagnetic fields become very important in this discovery. Because as you cross in there, it shoots up to 1700 megahertz, equivalent electromagnetic activity, horizontally, creating a dome-shaped effect. Again, this is why the GPS doesn't work inside there. But in between those two calendar stones in the middle, it shoots up even higher to 1800, but vertically straight out of the ground into the sky. And that just blew my mind, because that made me realize that we're dealing with something very special. Since I first started going there and taking psychics and connected people there, there have been hundreds that have told me things about the site that could not be told unless you knew something. So once again, the statistical probability that they were lying to me is out the window. They must be telling me the truth. And the recurring constant, that thing that I've been told by, you know, strange woo-woo people, is that it's an active vortex and a portal. Now that we've measured it, I believe them. Because this is the kind of thing that we measure there. Electromagnetic waves run horizontally, vertically, and then uh, horizontally, and then vertically coming out of it is one vertical shaft of electromagnetic waves straight into the sky. So what is this calendar site all about? What were they doing here? What were the Anunnaki doing here? They were getting gold. They were using the people to mine the gold, using advanced technology, Caesar technology, getting it off the planet. We know that they were getting it off the planet. Sitchin makes it very clear in his translations. But he says they, were, they would beam it up with skyships. I think he was very, very close to the truth, except the word skyships was misinterpreted in his translations. It wasn't skyships. It was a contraption like Adam's calendar. Beam up the gold, Scotty. Where do you want it? That's what we're dealing with here. They were getting the gold off the ground, off the earth, somewhere else. The gold isn't here. One of the biggest mysteries, where's Germany's gold? Where's the gold in the USA? The gold is missing. Suddenly, the, all, all the countries around the world are waking up that they don't have any gold. Well, this is an age-old story. It goes on for all of human history. Remember when the Spaniards arrived in the Americas and everywhere in the world, they found the native populations, they had all this gold, and they asked them, who does the gold belong to? There was always one answer they received, 
The gold belongs to the gods. And they were right. And they're getting it off the ground, off this planet. So, Caesar Technology was only discovered in the 17th June 2009. This was reported on in some of the scientific journals. Talking about sound as being used as laser beams. Not light, sound. And they think it's very exciting because it's got great applications in the military, obviously. And this is where the sacred stones come in. Because I believe these are not only energy devices like Tauruses, toroid energy generating fields because of the special stone that they're made of, but they're also frequency converters. One frequency in, another frequency out. And I believe that these pointy stones, like Ed Leeds Skullnan, was reported to move the giant blocks with two ice cream cones in his hands. Well, you hold those two in your hands, it'll look like you're holding ice cream cones in your hands. And at the point where they cross, beaming high frequency sound waves, they will create levitation. The higher the frequency, the higher the power and the energy, so you can lift huge things up and move it around as you want. Ice cream cones in your hands. Boy, those two schoolboys made my day. <laughs> there you go. What I find interesting is that average three centimeters, which equates to 10 gigahertz. So when we reverse engineer this, I'm looking for laboratories that work on, on laser technology. We can do some remarkable experiments, people. We'll change the world. We'll use these stones and we're going to discover new energies. And we can, any volunteers, we can put you in front there, set it up, and see what happens if we, if we phase you out or if you're still there. <laughs> 10 gigahertz. So what have we learned from all of this? If we don't learn something from this information, it's completely wasted on us. And uh, I believe we're going to have a break now. Is, it, is that true? We're going to have a break? No, no, no. no break. <laughs> so uh, I was going to have a 10-minute break, but mostly for your sanity, I'm used to this. So I believe that we're reaching the conclusion of a prophecy. All the ancient cultures have these great, amazing prophecies that last thousands and thousands of years. And they, they say that the end days will be as the first days. Did you know that in 1980, 80, in the mid-80s, four of the North American uh, native tribes came to South Africa to meet with Crater Mutwa and some of the African shaman because they believe that the new age will rise out of South Africa. It was quite amazing. And, uh, and they had all these ceremonies at, at these sacred sites and so forth. So the end days will be as the first days. Well, if humanity arose out of South Africa, then it should restart there again. And it makes me quite curious to see what's going on in South Africa at the moment. There's some really interesting things. And I seem to be involved in a few of those for some reason. But um, we're rediscovering free energy. We're discovering that sound is a source of energy. We just need to realize how to use it, figure out how to use all these ancient stone circles that give us insane amounts of free energy every second of the day. We just don't know how to use it. We're crossing the galactic plane. It's the rise and fall of civilizations, concluding these giant, as Plato called it, the great year. Um, and uh, we're exposed to frequencies and energies that we have probably haven't experienced in the last 26,000 years. So no wonder we're going through you know, turmoil and a lot of people are going crazy. They don't know how to deal with it. We're exposed to galactic light from the great sun, the, the cosmic... Uh, the center of our, of our galaxy. And we're exploding with consciousness. Why? Why are we exploding with consciousness? Because this, this galactic light is activating our DNA, and there's plenty of scientific evidence for that that you can go and look at if you still don't believe that. And it's doing amazing things. It's not just activating our junk DNA, 97% of it. So as our junk DNA gets activated, it creates a feedback mechanism, and we start to think higher thoughts, and our consciousness gets grows quicker and quicker. It's a beautiful thing, those people. And it's all connected to these crazy people you know, 280,000 years ago building stone circles in South Africa. They created us and allowed us to get to this point where we can contemplate our own existence and our own humanness and figure out how we fit into this great, crazy picture. We connect to the morphogenic field and realize that the resonance is... The morphogenic the, is the substance of the morphogenic field and, and plays a very important role in, you know, spooky action at a distance that scientists are still trying to get wrap their heads around. How does this all work? And this is where I realized that if we don't learn something 
from this ancient civilization and apply it today, it's going to be completely wasted. So I realized that these people lived for long, extended periods of time without money. And uh, it was Kerry Cassidy, when she first came to visit me three years ago, she suggested to me, you know what, you should start a political party. Because when you start sharing this information, it's not going to go down well, and you need to create a platform of credibility and protection. So I did that. And the Ubuntu Liberation Movement has now been registered as a fully-fledged political party in South Africa, and I'm going to be running for president next year. That's a, that's a <laughs> that is a, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard. But it's true. It's, I just realized, hey, we're running, yeah. And then somebody said, so it mean, does it mean you're running for president? I had to like do a double take. Oh, shit, yeah. I guess it means that, yeah. <laughs> we're just trying to cause trouble. We're just trying to inject the virus into the organism. But it has some really spectacular side effects <laughs> or things that we have to do. So we are all born on this beautiful planet. And we're all born free. And yet, we cannot move around freely. We cannot live where we choose to. We have to follow rules and laws that we didn't agree to when we were born. We have to work to pay taxes and to earn this thing called money. We didn't agree to that either when we were born. We didn't agree to be given a number and be treated like a corporation. We are living, breathing human beings. We're not numbers of infinite soul and flesh and blood. And yet that's not how we're being treated. The restrictions on humanity are endless and they're getting worse by the day. The current situation is very simple. Every social political system has failed us. This is why we're in this mess. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about this stuff, right? If it was hunky dory. Humans everywhere live in misery. There seems to be no happy outcome to the political and economic mess of the planet. Every year, every month, it gets worse. More poverty, more hunger, more homelessness, more misery. The global economic collapse is imminent. The fact that we still have a global economic system is actually miraculous, but it is a clear indication how powerful those individuals are that control the global economy. They have infinite power, as it is now. Only us, only we can do something about it. And there's some simple things that we can do about it to change everything about our lives and how we continue living as living, breathing human beings and not numbers and corporations or fictitious fictional entities. One third of the world's food goes to waste. This is spectacular. What kind of creatures have we become that we deny one third of the global population food because they don't have money? We don't, give, we don't hand it out. We dump it. We destroy it because we can't give it to them for free. They need money. They need to work, lazy bastards. Do some work. Go get a job. Become a respectable member of society. Get a job. We don't need jobs. It's the last thing we need. Every time I hear politicians say, we're going to create jobs, I'd sense shivers down my spine. It's the last thing we need. Busyness. Keep you busy running around forgetting what you should be doing, what kind of life you should be living. It's all encoded in the language that we use. How did it get so bad? This is where we get back to what we've just been to, the ancient civilizations. A small group of royal political families and the banking elite families took control of the world. This didn't happen last year or 100 years ago. This happened thousands of years ago, people. It started with the Sumerians about 6,000 years ago in the Middle East and Sumeria. When the Sumerian tablets tell us, when kingdom was lowered to earth from heaven, that's why I pointed it out to you. They tell us, kingdom was lowered to earth. Suddenly, we see these priest kings appear out of nowhere. How did these guys suddenly took on this higher than thou you know, situation? Who the hell are they? Where did they come from? Oh, people lived happily, and, and suddenly one guy said, hold on, I'm going to be your king. You're going to have to work for me and pay taxes. Screw you, buddy. I don't know. <laughs> so how did these priest kings in ancient times become so powerful? Because they were appointed by the gods. I'm not talking about God with a big G here. I'm talking about the gods with a small G, these arrogant pricks that came here and disturbed us on this beautiful planet. And what happened next after they appointed the priest kings? The most spectacular, miraculous thing happened. These priest kings created money. Money is not part of natural evolution. This is a complete misunderstanding of human history. Anyone that teaches you that has not done their homework. Money was maliciously introduced 
in ancient times as a tool of enslavement, the absolute tool of enslavement, and we are feeling the worst brunt of it right now. We are the guys, we are the civilization, we are the, the people on, in the history of this planet right now that can make a change. It's up to us what we do with this information and how we move from here forward. Today, there are three main banking families. There are arguably a few more, but the big ones, obviously, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, the Morgans, they control everything. They own all the banks in the world. How can I make the statement? Because they're the guys that bail out the banks when they go under. So they own them. It's simple, right? If you bail somebody out, you're going to own them. And you're not going to bail something out that you don't own, or at least that you don't control. So the World Bank, the IMF, the BI, the Bank of International Settlement in Basel, Switzerland, most people aren't even aware that there's a thing called the Bank of International Settlement. When they discover this, they, what? Wow, that's amazing. I hope they're good people. <laughs> Can't they give us a loan? <laughs> Remember, people, money doesn't exist. Okay, I'm going to get into this. Uh, yes, did you want to say? Okay. No, 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 no. I don't, no, no. Well, that's, that's what you're no, no, no. You, you're getting the wrong end of the stick. We, we, we created the. Yes, you are. We created the Ubuntu Liberation Movement. I'm going through it now. Just hold, hold on. You'll understand where I'm going with this. Okay. There, there's okay. going to be a lot of point in time to ask questions. Okay. No, Okay. Well, I'll, <laughs> don't worry, you'll get it. You, you'll get it by the time we finish here. I'm sure you will. Uh, the banking families own the world. It's simple as that. If you don't believe that, then you also haven't done your homework. So all the discussions we've been having, and I've been going into many of these discussions, money keeps coming up all the time. But remember, money doesn't exist. Money is just empty promises. It, there is no thing as money. In fact, for those of you that know, I've been, I've been actively involved in legal cases in South Africa against the banks. Not just the banks, against the Central Bank, the South African Reserve Bank, the Minister of Finance as well. I've even opened up a constitutional court case against the banks, the Minister of Finance and the Reserve Bank. Uh, which had an interesting ending. If we have time, we can talk about that. But uh, it doesn't stop. Uh, two years ago, myself and a small group of other people, mostly Scott Kundal, started uh, asking the banks certain questions. And, um, and we couldn't get answers out of them. And then we started doing research and realizing how it all works. And for the fractional reserve system, you all know that, or you should know that. And the fact that money doesn't exist. In fact, in the South African Bank Act, to my horror of horrors, and I was in court, and I was doing research to stand up and defend myself, because the only way we can do this is to, when you stand up in court and defend yourself. So we didn't use lawyers. I went there, and I stood and defended myself against the, the most you know, highest paid lawyers money can buy. And not just one of them, I was alone in the court against the judge that you have to call my lord and bow down when you walk into the court, my lord. And you start realizing the cabal, ritualistic club that these people belong to. It's spectacular. They wear black robes. And you go there, go there and call it my lord, my lord. I, you know, I thought I was going to cause trouble at first, but then I bit my tongue and I didn't do that. <laughs> and... And, but what I found is that in the Bank Act in South Africa, and I'm sure the same goes for, for the rest of the world, there is no definition for the world money. There is, however, a definition for bills of exchange, promissory notes, and negotiable instruments. And I realized the banks don't work with money. The banks work with promissory notes, bills of exchange, and negotiable instrument. And, and those are called liquid because they have value. They are the liquid, valuable instruments, negotiable instruments, that banks work with behind the scenes. And this becomes really exciting and interesting. So we started realizing we could create promissory notes and bills of exchange and liquid negotiable instruments as soon as they have our signature on it. And we started doing some of this, just causing trouble. Anyway, it didn't get us very far because the judges didn't understand this at all. They thought we were, we were just causing trouble with the courts. But nevertheless, what we managed to do in the three Supreme Court cases that I defended myself against these banksters, we managed to get very important things out of the lawyers or the bankers. They admitted to everything we accused them of. 
We accuse them of breaking the, bank, the, the contract law because they don't have what they pretend to loan. They don't have the money. Remember, in contract law, you, need, you can't lend something that you do not possess. So when, that was one of our arguments. So we said, well, the banks aren't actually banks because they don't own any money. And they admitted, yes, no, we don't own any money. So, OK, great. Judge, did you get that? And, um, and then we said, well, that means that you're an agent and you're not a banker. So you can't charge interest and you can't come after me because the contract is null and void. And then we realized that they securitize your signature. They sell every document you have, every document you sign with your signature on it and has a value on it is sold into, in a process called securitization. And uh, this is a global industry. Global banking industry works with securitization. And they're very proud of it. They publish the securitization information on their websites. But then when you argue securitization in court, they deny it. They say, no, we don't know what you're talking about. No. And the judges don't go and do their homework because the judges are so blinded by the banks and the lawyers, they just follow. They just can't imagine that the banks could be lying. So they, they agree that they practice securitization. Well, first of all, they, they, they denied that, that there is anything called securitization. They accused us of being fanciful and, and making things up and um, that they didn't have money to lend. We accuse them of not having locus standi or any rights to start the action against you because they sell your documents and your contract to a third party called a special purpose vehicle. And that special purpose vehicle company is a third party that takes complete ownership of your property, your car, your credit card debt, your overdraft. Everything is securitized by the banks because they don't have money. That's how they make money for themselves. It's all shuffling paper and bookkeeping entries and selling empty promises. And this is how junk bonds are created, because once you haven't paid on your bond, three months after you haven't paid on your home loan, your bond, uh, that goes stale. The, what this, the, secure, the SPV uh, does, they then claim insurance on it, and they, they file it. So the SPV gets paid, the bank has been paid the moment they sell your signature to them. Everyone's been paid, but you keep paying for your home loan for the next 30 years. The moment you stop paying, the bank comes after you, says you owe us money, there's a contract, my lord, See, he signed a contract, he owes us money. And the judge doesn't for one second say, well, hold on, let's look at the validity of this contract. Do you have rights to this contract? Who owns the property? So this has now been exposed. We are this close in South Africa. Myself and Scott Cundell from New Economics Rights Alliance, we are this close from bringing down the banks. Yes. This close. Yes. So, Because they're just lying thieves. What you're, talking, what you're talking about, the global banking industry people, is nothing more than the largest legalized organized crime syndicate. That's what it is. So they're a bunch of criminals. We've got to do something about it to stop it. So I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got two cases against the banks now. One of five counts of fraud. Uh, which they don't they haven't argued any of the points. They've argued why I'm why I'm claiming all the money <laughs> that I'm claiming. They're not arguing any of the points. And Scott Kundal has got a case with New Economics Rights Alliance, which has become the third largest nonprofit organization in South Africa in the last six months, about 160,000 members. Um, he's he's launched a case of of unconstitutionality against all the banks. We're about to launch criminal charges against the banks full-blown criminal charges, because the evidence is just becoming overwhelming. And all it's going to take now, one judgment. If there are any mathematicians here, you can see the complete insaneness of this. Out of thousands and thousands and thousands of court cases, people against banks, not one person has ever won a case against the banks. Just think about that. Clearly, this is stacked in favor of the banks, oh, yeah. Yeah. clearly. And the judges are either paid off or they're too stupid to understand what's going on. But things have changed. We have a few situations in South Africa. We've had small victories where the banks withdrew. This is how clever they are. They withdraw before they get a judgment or they abandon. So there isn't a precedent on the record. So you can't then go and argue the precedent. So they're very clever with this. But we're going to force them into a judgment because of what we're doing. And. Um, it's just going to take that first judgment and then it's all over. The entire global banking system works on the same principles and it's just going to be a domino effect and we'll do what Iceland did, hopefully. Just reverse all the mortgage loans, reverse all the car loans, credit card, just, you know, 
just reverse everything because these thugs have stolen trillions from us and make us their slaves. And that's exactly what they do. And this is linked to our education system because most people are indoctrinated into this way of thinking since childhood. Um, this is, our education system has nothing to do with learning. It's, it's really developed and funded by the banking families um, to condition humanity into following orders and respecting authority. They control the contents of all the textbooks and, and uh, transfer of information. Our schools are really just indoctrination camps to brainwash our children to follow orders and to bow to authority. It's got nothing to do with learning, people. The money, con money controls the legal system, as I mentioned already. And uh, if you just look on the internet on a daily basis, you'll see that the economic collapse is just imminent. It's somehow being uh, kept alive. The question is, and this is what I need to end on, because we can't keep talking about doom and gloom all the time. We need to talk about what are we going to do as a species? What are we going to do when it all collapses? And this is where the most exciting thing happens. And this is my message to everyone in the world. This is where the true humanity shines, and we realize how beautifully we can survive without money. We have to find a new system, because this system is broken. It doesn't work. Um, we cannot continue doing what we've been doing for the past 6,000 years. That is insanity, and as you know, insanity is defined as doing something over and over again and expecting different results. So hopefully after 6,000 years, we now have learned. Don't try and fix the current system. Change it completely. What is the one thing that we can do to change it? You know what that is. And this is where the Ubuntu Liberation Movement comes in. <laughs> Join the movement. Realize it's a movement about higher consciousness. It's about, it's about breaking all the norms that we've been conditioned to believe, standing up to authority, and taking back what belongs to us, living, breathing human beings. The Ubuntu Contribution System, I called it Contributionism in 2005 when I first started writing about it. Completely new social structure, abundance for all. It's based on ancient knowledge when they didn't have money, where everyone contributes their natural talents or acquired skills for the greatest benefit of all in the community. It's a simple system. It comes with a lot of questions because we're so poisoned by capitalism, con consumerism. Raises many questions instantly, but I've been through this thousands and thousands of times. I can already think what tell you what you're thinking, and I'm going to tell you what you're thinking just now. It goes back to the African roots called Ubuntu. All ancient cultures, in a way, shared this African system called Ubuntu. They have different names for it, but it always comes down to the same thing. It's amazing that the ancient cultures survived for thousands of years, not using money, and they thrived, as Foster Gamble would say. And they had a similar philosophy. If it's not good for everyone, it's no good at all. And that is a beautiful philosophy that I'd like to share with everybody because I don't want to do anybody harm. And I don't want to do anything that's going to harm anyone because it does me good. I'm not interested in doing that. And this is why the whole Ubuntu contributionism system, the Ubuntu movement, is a movement of higher consciousness. It is for people moving into a new age, a new era of higher consciousness. Exactly that. So that's the virus we want to inject into the South African parliament. Higher consciousness. Not because I want to run for president. In fact, if by some miracle I became president, and this was a question that was asked me in Durban last weekend at our first public meeting. So what's going to do? If, what are you going to do if you become president? I said, well, the first thing I'll do is I'll dissolve the government. Just dissolve the whole government. Just, just, just dismantle it. And give the power to the people wherever they are to start their own local communities. Rewrite the laws. The laws we have are not written for the people, they're written for the corporations. Our inalienable rights, this is what I need to remind people of. And this is <clears throat> beautiful because this is part of the ANC's Freedom Charter that they stood for for over 100 years. Now, it's been very conveniently forgotten. And this has become the, the new Freedom Charter for the Ubuntu movement. The country belongs to the people. The land belongs to its people. The water, the minerals, the air, the airwaves doesn't belong to Vodafone, it belongs to the people. The forests and everything in the country belongs to the people. <laughs> yeah. the, the land in China belongs to the people and they should do exactly the same. This applies to every country, people. It does not belong to the government or any large corporation that has laid claim to it. And when you read this statement, you realize that We've appointed our leaders to be our servants, but they're not serving us. We appointed them to do the best for us, not for them, 
So whatever we want and we need as a people, they should be doing for us. Is that happening? No. The opposite is happening. So what has happened here? The government is not serving the people. The only conclusion we can reach is that they're serving themselves and the corporation that fund them. They've turned the people into their slaves. The government and large corporations have stolen the country from its people. It's as simple as that. We've become the slaves, and unless we do something about it, it stops. How do we know this? In South Africa, I don't know about these countries. I believe uh, the European countries, how it works now. I haven't done that research because I'm focusing there. The government of South Africa and the Republic of South Africa are both registered as two separate corporations on the U.S. Securities Exchange. So they're corporations that trade us as commodities. Every week, new laws are passed in every country, I guess, in South Africa. It's published in the Government Gazette. Nobody knows where to get it, how to read it, what it means, but they publish it in the Government Gazette and they get away with it. You see, it was published. You didn't object, so now it's a new law. That's how they get away with it. But every week, they publish new laws that we don't understand and we don't want. Our laws protect the corporations. They do not serve the people. Corporations have more rights than living, breathing human beings. I've witnessed this in my own presence in court on three occasions. And the fun gets better every day. Because, you know, um, for those of you that have been following some of what I've been doing, uh, two weeks ago, our legal advisor, Raymond Dix, was attacked in his house by ten armed men, uh, tied up and held at gunpoint for three and a half hours while they ransacked his office, his home office. They made it look like a, a robbery, but uh, when they left and very carefully removed his computer, his hard drive, his backup hard drive, and his secondary hidden backup hard drive, which they knew exactly where it was, they left with only two other things. The legal files pertaining to my actions against the courts, the, the banks, and Scott Kundal's files, New Economics Rights Alliance, the Ubuntu movement, my movement, and New Economics Rights Alliance. Those are the only files, legal files that disappeared. So it's very clear what's going on here. The banks hit us where it hurts most, that our nerve center removed all our research, documentation, and files, but we had backups elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> so now it's obvious, you know, if they take me out, they just created another martyr. So bring it on. <laughs> I, I don't care. I know where I'm going. I'm going to sit on the right-hand side of Jesus. <laughs> we need a whole new legal system written for the people, by the people, not by the corporations and the governments that want to schneid the people into the ground. Everything in South Africa and in other countries belongs to the people. ESCOM, for example, is the electricity supply giant that supplies most of Africa with electricity. All the installations of ESCOM belong to the people. The coal they use that they get out of the ground to charge us for the electricity belongs to the people because the coal belongs to the people. Sasol is the, the coal to, to liquid uh, petroleum company that was paid for by the taxpayer. The technology was developed from German technology in the 1920s. That was paid for by the South African taxpayer, all the early installations for Cecil. So all the fuel that we should be driving on in South Africa, we should have virtually for free. Because all the components belong to the people. The railways run every day, but they don't transport people. They transport coal and wood. Everything for the corporations, nothing for the people. You can't catch a train anywhere in South Africa. And so it goes. The forestry, the minerals. Forestry between Sapi and Mondi in South Africa, they own more than a million hectares of land that they somehow managed to take possession of. Who gave it to them? The people didn't agree to give it to them, but it belongs to them. So you can see how this theft of the land and the, the, all the inalienable rights of the people of the land have been stolen and given to corporations. So the government and the large corporations have stolen the country from its people. It's obvious. What do the people need? This is where we start seeing the beautiful side and how simple things can be. What do we need? We need food, water, love, friendship, homes, tables, chairs, knives, forks, gardens, clothes, technology, healthcare, arts and culture. We need everything that each and every one of you can imagine and beyond. We need everything and we should have all of it because there should be no hurdles to achieving this and having that, right? 
We do not need money. Did you see money anywhere in that list? No, we don't need money. Money gets in the way. Money is the obstacle. It's the hurdle to all progress. Money does nothing. People do everything. People plow the lands, grow the food, build the bridges, build the rockets, solve the mathematical equations, create the technology. People do everything. Money does nothing. Money is just the obstacle to all this incredible progress. People create the arts and the culture. Money does nothing. The origins of money goes back to Sumeria once again. These Sumerians, the first forms of money were really little clay tablets. They were tokens of exchange. And then eventually they started minting them, as you know. So for millennia, great minds have stood up against the abuse of humanity through money. It's not something new. Julius Caesar stood up against the money, the, 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 the powers of money. It took back from the money changes the power to coin money and minted coins on benefit of all. With his new plentiful supply of money, he established many massive construction projects and built great public works. And we all know what happened to Julius Caesar. <laughs> St. Thomas Aquinas in 1225 said that the charging of interest is wrong because it applies to double charging, charging for both the money and the use of money. In fact, church law in the Middle Ages forbade the charging of interest on loans and even made it a crime called usury, which we know very well today. And even Jesus in his last year of life, probably the only physical force he ever applied was throughout the money changes out of the temple because they were abusing the people. And this is by far the most cutting statement made in recent times, Thomas Jefferson, because this is what we find ourselves in today. I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties and standing armies. If the American people ever allow private banks, remember all our banks in the world, are virtu virtually all the banks are private banks, private corporations whose interest is making profit at all cost. So... If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and the corporations that will grow up around the, the banks will drive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. That's where we are standing today. All over the world, this is the situation we're in. Money is the obstacle to all progress. It does nothing for society. It is the absolute tool of control by those that control the issue and the printing of money. That's why when I say they own the world, they do. They literally, physically own the world in each of one of our asses. It prevents the natural flow of free energy. And that is very important to this weekend's activities here. Money prevents the natural flow of free energy. So I beg you, everyone present here, Remember, it's about free energy, not I'm going to make a billion dollars out of this energy. Give it away for free. It'll come back to you in ways you cannot imagine. Do that one thing for humanity. If you find any source of free energy, don't try and make zillions out of it. It will kill you or they will kill you before you can get it out there. Money is the primary cause for the seven deadly sins. We all know the seven deadly sins, or have we forgotten them already? It's not the love of money. Many people ask, oh, it's just the love of money. Money is nothing wrong with money, man. It's just a form of exchange. You know, we're so poisoned that we, we, try, and, we try and argue for, for it. We try and defend it. That's how poisoned our minds have become. It's incredible. It's not the love of money. It's the mere presence of money that causes all these problems. If you take money out of the system, all this stuff suddenly and miraculously vanishes. So what is the solution? If it's the mere presence of money or the love of money of all of the above, what are we going to do to solve the problem? The answer is so blatantly obvious. Remove money. Just get rid of it. Get rid of it. What do we need it for? It's causing all the strife in our lives. It's destroying our planet. The mines are raping our mother earth, taking out the precious guts out of our Gaia and distributing it around the world to people that claim they own it. It's sick. The obvious questions, if you remove money, so who's going to shovel the crap? How are we going to pay for things? I'll just sit in my ass and do nothing. I want 50 Ferraris. <laughs> you know, are we going back to the dark ages, living in caves? Is this a lawless society? Who's going to make the rules? Why should I do something I don't want? These are the first things. I know that these are the most commonly asked questions, and I'm sure that you're asking some of them to yourselves. But... Um, 
I can tell you that as you work through this process of a moneyless society, a Ubuntu society where everybody contributes their natural talents or acquired skills to the greatest benefit of all, with certain minor rules that are not rules, it's really just an agreement that this is how we're going to work together. The moment you start working in that kind of community, the abundance is so spectacular that we right now cannot imagine it. It is not possible for us to imagine it until you start immersing yourself in this kind of thinking. And I call these the Ubuntu communities, as I said, where everyone contributes their natural talents or acquired skills for the greater benefit of all in the community. A new social structure for a new world and a new age. Abundance for all beyond our wildest belief. There are five mantras, five key points to the Ubuntu society. And it's not barter or trade. Everybody often jumps, a lot of people jumps to the, to the conclusion, think, oh, let's go back to barter. No. He who has more to barter or trade will eventually rule the roost. So you can't go to that system. If you have nothing to trade, what are you going to say? Well, I've got nothing to trade, so I'll have to, you know, kiss your butt. No. So the Ubuntu contribution mantra is the five points. No money, no barter, no trade, no value attached to anything greater or lesser than anything else. Because why? Each one of our contributions should be and is equally valuable. If you start telling, well, I'm a doctor, my time is more valuable than yours, you're barking up the wrong tree, brother. Okay. So, and the final one where everyone contributes for the greater benefit of all in the community because that is how you get rewarded. You get rewarded by the recognition of the people in your community. Isn't that the highest reward everybody wants and is trying to buy with money is recognition and respect of others? In essence, ultimately, that's what most people really want, is just to be loved and recognized for what they've done. And they think they can use money to do that. And then when they make a lot, a lot of money, they get zillions in the bank, then they suddenly realize, oh, well, nobody loves me anymore. They all want to take my money. So let me spend my money, and then people will love me. And that's generally what happens when they start paying for things, and people love them more, when they start giving it away. <laughs> so united Ubuntu communities. In unity, we thrive, and anything is possible. Anything is possible. A world without money. There's no crime, no envy, no gluttony, no greed, no hoarding, no hierarchy. And the whole Ubuntu, the Ubuntu movement and the Ubuntu party has no hierarchy. Communities look after themselves. We have no central government. We don't have any central assholes trying to tell you how you should be running your life. No obstacles to any kind of progress. Because the solutions are simple and there are many bright minds here. We all know what the solutions are, what should be done to solve the problems, and somehow our politicians just can't get it right. They just they keep screwing it up, you know? So don't ask the politicians to solve it. Give it to the scientists, give it to the farmers, give it to the engineers. They'll solve the problems for us. Ordinary people will. Politicians will do nothing. Transition will have to occur in simple steps that flow from one to the other. We can't go from zero to hero. We can't go from a moneyless-driven, capitalistic, consumeristic monster to a moneyless society that lives in harmony and zen, right? It's not going to happen. So uh, if you go onto my website, the ubuntuparty.org.za website, I've started posting a number of papers on how the transition will take place. There's not time for it now, so I ask you, please go onto our website and check it out. It's beautiful. What's key here is that the small towns will probably play a very important part in the transformation. Because in small towns and small communities, people will agree on things a lot quicker than in the big cities. right? So they will agree, okay, we need to get off the grid. We need to grow enough food for all of us. We need to make sure we got water. And they can go out and do it. We must create alternative energy for ourselves in our town. So if the grid goes down, we stay alive. And the small towns and villages will become the activators of this transitional phase. And I put together a few theories and ideas to give people ideas how to start doing this. It also goes into, into our education and schooling systems, where we stop, stop sending your children to school. Please, I beg you, don't send your children to school. Don't do it. You're turning them into monsters. I've had an hour, a few, few of my friends in Johannesburg in South Africa that have not sent their kids to school. They are much smarter than the kids that go to school. And I'm not kidding you. They really are. They just learn from their parents and they learn... and. And you'll find that, that what, often what happens with these kids, they start reading later. They might start reading a little bit later. But when they start reading, they become like these, they become like these monster little readers that just read everything. I mean, these little kids are reading books that you know, other kids don't even dream of. 
And that's because they're not preconditioned by the schooling system. <coughs> Energy, water, food, housing, arts and recreation. These are the things that small communities can take control of very, very quickly and establish it for themselves, make themselves go off the grid and be totally in control of their own destiny. And many, many community projects must be and should be attached to this activity. Absolute abundance on all levels. Once you start doing this, food, science, culture, community, abundance on all levels. Now, I'm going to give you a small example. You've got to use your imagination here because there's not enough time now and we've got to finish off here. So imagine in the little town that I live, we've got a river, we've got a fish farm, we've got a dairy farm, we've got a bakery, we've got a wood, fa wood, wood factory, a metal factory. The community starts to work in these projects. The, the whole Ubuntu thing means that, and contribution means that everybody must contribute three hours a week towards one of these community projects. That's all you have to do, three hours a week. A little town of a thousand people, it's 3,000 hours a week. No municipality or town council can afford 3,000 3, hours a week salaries for people to do this work. Can you see how that's dramatically shifted the status quo and the equilibrium? How much we can produce if we just work for three hours a week on basic projects, producing milk, cheese, butter, fish, breeding fish, uh, baking bread, planting, growing vegetables, and so forth. So now the community has been doing this for six months or a year, and they've established abundance on all levels, where all the people in that community that participate, that's why I called it contributionism, that participate and add their t talent and their skills and their time, get everything, not for free, but virtually for free, so cheaply that the rest of the stuff, and also there's a principle where you, man, where you, where you create three times as much as you need for your own community. And I structure everything in the, in the Ubuntu uh, philosophy on the sacred geometry principles, 3366. So you produce three times as much as you need for your community. Why? Because there'll be other communities that can't produce what you're doing, so you'll be actually helping them while they're helping you with the things that you can't produce. So, and by the end of that, there's so much abundance because you're doing it three times that Whatever you don't consume in your own little village or town, what are you going to do with? You're going to make it available on farmer's markets and stores in your town for the surrounding communities. The moment you've achieved that state, you've created the domino effect. Because what's going to happen to all the neighboring towns? All the people from those towns are going to come buy your bread, your milk, your cheese, your whatever it is you produce. Because it's going to be a fraction of the cost they pay for it in their own town. There's your domino effect. There's your trigger point. So... Think about it from that perspective. At the, at the outset, it sounds like a huge thing. Wow, how are we going to go from there to a moneyless society? I believe that I've just taken you through a very simplistic examples, example of how small towns and small villages and communities can be the trigger points and the examples that start the domino effect. Once the first town is set up, it's impossible for the surrounding towns to stay alive. They will have to follow the same example. Otherwise, all their businesses will close down. And when they do close down, then they will follow your example. So either they will do it willingly or they'll be forced into it because of stupidity. In, in the Ubuntu communities, children follow their passion and their dreams. The education system changes completely. There are no classrooms. Children learn real practical skills. So by the age of 16, they've done everything. They've baked the bread. They've, they've worked in nuclear laboratories. They've built rockets. They've built homes. They've created... But they've created earth, built earth ships. They've planted seedlings and grown fruit. And they'll be so wise by the time you're 16 because you've had all this experience. You'll be smarter than all the professors in the world thrown together today. <laughs> so, take, take any school lever today. Put them on a farm. Put them anywhere into a practical solution. What can a person with a high school diploma do today? Absolutely nothing. We're useless to society. That's what they've created. Can you see the brilliance in their plan? They are so smart, these people. They. <laughs> That's us, right? <laughs> so we are so smart that we're doing this to ourselves, right? Where we create our children, turn our children into these little, we lock them up in jails for 12 years, most precious years of their life, and then throw them out to start all over again and, and be totally open to manipulation and control.
So master teachers, only when a community decides that you're a master shoemaker or you're a master rocket scientist or you're a master baker or a master this, only the community can decide who they will allow to teach their children. Isn't that a better system than teachers that go and get some diploma and they're real assholes and they teach your child? You go, God, how can that? I'm not going to let that teacher teach my child. The community will have the final say. So when I say decentralized government, that's how fine it becomes. The community chooses who their master teachers are, the people that they have respect for and the people that they honor for their capacity and their ability. And this is how we grow, how we build Ubuntu communities because only out of unity comes infinite diversity and abundance. Only out of unity. Anything else is a futile exercise that will bring us back to the same point at some future point in time. So I'm going to end here because this is the end. Join the Ubuntu Liberation Movement. It's not just a South African entity. We've had various people around the world say to us, can we start the same thing in, in wherever? Yes. Go online. Start the same thing. Use all the material I've published. Put it out there. Share it with everybody. And become part of this transitional phase. And uh, thank you for listening. I hope I gave you some food for thought. Please, please wait one moment. People are coming up to me and asking me, what can we do after the conference? Now, one of the things we can do after the conference, Michael needs exposure, <laughs> big time. We need a bus going around. <laughs> Everybody who is, uh, has a Facebook page, a Twitter page, you just put one line. Michael Tellinger for president, <laughs> and, and, and this website. People are going to pick it up sooner or later on the internet, and it's going to be recycled, 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 recycled. It's safer. We're going to get the word out, and the ball is going to roll. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs>